Let's turn over to the book of Hebrews. For those of you that haven't been here, I've been trying to talk about what is God really like. And the reason this needs explanation is because Satan is a deceiver and he is... You know, we turned the very first scripture I turned to last night was Genesis chapter 3 and he told Adam and Eve the reason God doesn't want you to eat of the tree is because he doesn't love you. He's trying to hold something back from you. He doesn't want you to be like him. He began to malign and misrepresent the very nature and character of God. If Adam and Eve would have known how good God was, they would have never fallen for that deception. They wouldn't have ever eaten of this. And you know, in a sense, you can issue them a pass because they didn't have the same revelation that we've got. But today, God sent His Son, Jesus, and He died for us and took our sins. And we should not be falling for this same stuff. And yet the average person today doesn't understand how much God loves them. They'll say that God loves them, and in the same breath, they'll say, He loved me so much, He put this cancer on me. He caused my child to be born this way. He caused my business to fail. He made my marriage fail. I tell you what, uh, somehow or another, it's just been all twisted and perverted. If we really knew how much God loved us, we would just be rejoicing and living in a continual feast. But we, religion has hindered this. And so I've been countering a lot of things. And I was making this point that it's actually a lot of things in the Bible that Satan has used to give people a wrong impression about God because under the old covenant, God released his anger and released his wrath. And people take those portions of scripture and say that God is angry at you and that God is going to judge you and punish you and even though those things happened in the Old Covenant, that is not the true nature of God. And last night, I started showing that uh, for the first 2,000 years, God didn't impute man's sins unto him. Then he gave the law, and things changed the way that God dealt with people. But in Galatians chapter 3, it says that that was only temporary until Jesus should come. And I used a bunch of scriptures this morning, a lot of scriptures to show that the Old Testament law is not for us and we should not be relating to God the way that the Old Testament people did. You know, I just said some things right there that are so off the page from what most people think that many of you, if you didn't hear this teaching, may reject some of the things that I've said. But please, I encourage you to get those tapes and listen to my explanation and turn over and read these scriptures before you reject it because I had scriptures to stand on for every one of those points that I made. Tonight, I want to show you some things in the book of Hebrews because, again, this is stressing the same point. And the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. It was written to Jews. And it was specifically written to Jewish Christians to get them out of the Old Testament law and have them start serving God under this New Testament relationship. And there's a lot of things in here. Probably the book of Hebrews isn't your favorite book in the Bible. Most people, it's confusing to them, and that's because we don't understand grace. And this is written all about the grace of God. And so if you don't have a revelation of grace, Hebrews is a strange book to you. But if you do understand it, it is a masterpiece of explaining the grace of God. In the first chapter, he starts talking about how that God has spoken to us in these latter times by Jesus, and Jesus supersedes every other revelation that God has ever given us. It says this in Hebrews 1.3, talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. It says that Jesus here was the express image of his person. And if you take it in context, the point that he's making is that angels gave us some revelation of, G of God, uh, Moses gave us a partial revelation of God and there's been bits and pieces revealed but Jesus is the perfect representation of God. He supersedes everything else. And so chapter 2 starts talking about therefore we have to take what Jesus revealed to us about God the Father above every other re revelation that there was. Chapter 3 talks about he's the uh, apostle and high priest of our profession and that we have to give heed unto him. In chapter 4, it talks about a thing called the Sabbath rest. 
This is one of the things that just excites me the most. I've taught on this a lot, and I've got a teaching entitled Our Sabbath Rest. If Hebrews chapter 4 isn't one of your favorite chapters in the Bible, you need to get that teaching. This is awesome. And it shows you that in the New Testament, the Sabbath isn't a day, it's a relationship with the Lord. There are people who are observing a certain day, and they are Sabbath breakers. They aren't resting in Jesus. They aren't resting in what the Father did. They are doing things by their own effort, trying to earn God's favor, and they are Sabbath breakers. The Sabbath has been fulfilled in Christ. And so in chapter 5, he begins to start talking about how that there are many things that he wants to say, but they're hard to say because they're dull of hearing. Chapter 6 is a rebuke about wise up. Leave the baby things and go on into the Word of God and figure these things out because we now have a new covenant. And so that brings us up to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, he starts into the main point trying to show you that we are no longer under the Old Testament law. And one of the ways he does this is to show that Jesus isn't a priest through the tribe of Levi, which the Old Testament law said that any person who tried to offer sacrifices to God except the tribe of Levi and even more specifically the house of Aaron. You had to be a direct descendant of Aaron. If anybody tried to do that, God would judge them. And there's examples of Uzziah the king who tried to offer a sacrifice and God struck him with leprosy. So it was a well-established uh, fact in the law that to be a priest, you had to be out of the tribe of Levi. And uh, Hebrews chapter 7 says that Jesus came from Melchizedek out of the tribe of Judah, not out of the tribe of Levi. Now that's a big point because it means Jesus doesn't fit into the Old Testament law. And then he quotes from Psalms 110 verse 4, and David prophesied this, that Jesus would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it was prophesied in the Old Testament. The writers of Hebrew is saying Jesus came through the tribe of Judah, the priesthood of Melchizedek, and he makes this statement in Hebrews chapter 7, and in verse 12 it says, for, it, uh, for the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So if Jesus isn't a Levite, which he wasn't, he came out of the tribe of Judah, he was a descendant of David, well then what right did he have to be a priest? Because he was the priest out of the order of Melchizedek. And the rest of this chapter, I'm not going to spend time going through it, but it shows you that Jesus, Melchizedek's priesthood, superseded Levi's priesthood. And it goes back to Genesis chapter 14 to prove that. So anyway, those are important things. But here's some of the points that I was wanting to get to. In Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 18, it says, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. This word disannulling is a strong word. You know, if you annul something, like if you annul a marriage, that means that you go in and act like it never happened. You can go in and say that in the sight of the law they were never married, even though they may have gotten a marriage license or whatever. You can disannul the marriage and it legally never happened. And, or excuse me, that's to annul a marriage. To disannul it is even a strengthened form of saying that. The Greek word that's used here, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it's the word we get antithesis from. In other words, the antithesis means the exact opposite. When you say that is the antithesis of something, you are saying that is the exact opposite of what I was saying. This is saying that there is literally a, a disannulment, a complete stopping of this thing, and it's in the opposite direction of what the Old Testament law was. Again, these verses make it very clear that the Old Testament law and the New Testament grace do not complement each other. They are contradictory to each other. Now again, I hate to even say this because I'm trying to get on, but I know that there's some people here sitting here saying, so are you saying that the law is sin? That it wasn't good? We dealt with that this morning, but not everybody was here this morning. 
But no, that's not what I'm saying. There was a purpose of the law. It was to bring you to the end of yourself, to show you your sinfulness, to make you sin conscious, to stop your mouth, to make you guilty, to make sin come alive. It strengthened sin. It ministered death. It ministered condemnation. All of those are scriptures that we use this morning. There was a purpose of the law to shut you up from self-righteousness and self-salvation so that you had to depend upon God. If you use the law for that, it's okay. But when you try and administer the law, a performance mentality to people who have already made Jesus their Lord, it ceases to be a positive thing and it becomes a negative thing. All the law does is focus on you and your failures. It does not point you to a savior and to his grace and his forgiveness. It is counterproductive. It's in the opposite direction. It's the antithesis of grace. Grace and law are opposites. You cannot be following the grace of God and at the same time trying to live by the Old Testament law. They are in opposite directions. That's like trying to say you're walking east and west at the same time. You just can't do it. It is impossible. And I know the things I'm saying are just radical and some people think you can't mean this. I'm reading it to you right here. It says, for there is very a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. That is one strong passage of scripture. And, it, and from here on, it just starts adding on and talking about how that we've got to turn from the Old Testament law and start relating to God through the new covenant. So let me skip down to chapter 8. And in chapter 8, he kind of summarizes the first seven chapters of the book of Hebrews. He says in verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. And from here on, he makes some contrast between the temple or the tabernacle that was made by Moses and the true tabernacle that was in heaven. When Moses was on the mount, God showed him into heaven. And he's, there is a temple, a physical temple in heaven. And Moses saw it and patterned the tabernacle after that temple that's in heaven. And this is what it's referring to, that Moses established a tabernacle here on the earth that was symbolic of and reminded us of heaven, but heaven has a temple in it, and Jesus is now ministering in the true temple of God as a high priest for us. He's not just symbolic. Jesus is the real deal, and he's doing it. And that's the point that he's beginning to make right here. And in verse 3, it says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices where it is, where, whereof it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer, for if they were on the earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, this is a quotation from uh, the book of Exodus, See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he, talking about Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. We have something better than the Old Testament law. And yet it's amazing how Christians want to continue to remain under the bondage of the Old Testament. In verse 7, For if that first covenant, talking about the law, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith. And here's another Old Testament uh, quotation. This is from Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse 31. So this was prophesied in the Old Testament. And here is the New Testament quotation of Jeremiah chapter 31. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the commandment that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not. 
You know, I want to go on and read the rest of this. I hate to break into it, but let me explain this. The reason he's not making the same type of covenant that he made before because the first covenant was conditional upon their performance. They had to obey it. And it was conditional. If you will do this, then I will do this. And he says, that didn't work. Not because God's promise was wrong, but because we could not keep the law. We basically disannulled the law ourselves by our lack of performance. And so when he got ready to make the new covenant, the new covenant is totally different than the old covenant. It's not based on your performance. It's based on Jesus' performance. Jesus earned relationship with God the Father, and when you make Jesus your Lord, you become a joint heir with him, not based on performance, but based upon your acceptance of Jesus. And as long as Jesus remains faithful, you get all of the benefits. And I guarantee you, Jesus is going to remain faithful. So this is a new covenant based on a different uh, criteria. The only criteria is Jesus has to be worthy, not you. Man, that is a big, big difference right there. And so in verse 19, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. You know, in the Old Testament, it was just a physical law that constrained your actions. Did you know you can take the law and minister it to a lost man and get them to obey to a degree? Because it's just a carnal, natural thing. You can preach the law. You can preach Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 to a lost man and say, Are you going to rob God? How would you rob God? In tithes and in offerings. You're cursed with the curse. God's going to get you. Pay up or else. <laughs> and instead of talking about God the Father, you basically are representing him as the Godfather. Pay up or I'm going to break your knees. You're going to go into the hospital. And that's basically the way that God has been represented. But in the new covenant, it's God saying, every man give as you purpose in your heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. God wants to draw you by love and not by external things. And see, this is what this is talking about, that you don't have to have other people tell you what God's going to... God will establish a relationship with you personally and you will know in your heart what's right and wrong. A person who is truly born again has an intuitive leading of the Holy Spirit that shows you right from wrong. Now you may not be doing very well because religion actually strengthens sin and makes sin come alive on the inside of you, but if you are truly born again, you're miserable when you go live in sin. It's not your heart. That's one of the ways you can tell that you've been born again. You may still do some of the same things that you did before you got born again, but before you were born again, you didn't really care. Now you do care, and it bothers you that you're still doing that. That's because God has changed your heart, and every one of us has a personal relationship with God, not just listening to somebody else tell us. You can hear from God directly. And then in verse... Uh, 12, it says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Did you know that that is nearly too good to be true news? This is contrary to what religion is saying. You will not find religion preaching that God is merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. Religion will preach that God is angry at you. God's ticked off. God is about ready to turn you into hell. He's not going to answer your prayers. That's the reason you don't have joy and peace is God is holding sin against you, imputing it unto you. This says the new covenant that was prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31 says, you're, I will be merciful to your iniquities to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. 
You know, I was making television programs this last week. We had a woman come in. She used to be a Bible college student of ours, and she only went to one year, and she quit. And she came back, and she wanted to sit in on a, on a lesson, and I was teaching through the book of Romans. And after I got through, this woman came up, and there was about, you know, there was our television crew. There was about five or six people in the studio. And this woman just started crying, and she says, Man, I needed this. This was God. And she started telling me that the reason she quit school was because she's pregnant and she's not married. And she says, I've been living in sin. And she says, I needed to know that God loved me. And you know what? Because of the grace, I, I put my arm around her and I said, God loves you. God's not mad at you. I said, it's wrong what you did and it hurt you. And you need to turn from this because it's not good for you. This is not a good environment to bring this child up in. I ministered the love to her and this woman just repented and man, she is back on fire and seeking the Lord. It was the goodness of God that led her to repentance. But religion would have come out and said, you're a sinner, look what you did, the wrath of God is on you. What she, did, what she did was wrong. Now see, there's a balance here. Some people will take grace and say, well, that's not wrong. Don't tell them that that's sin. There is nothing wrong anymore. No, it's still wrong. But God loved her. He was merciful to her unrighteousness and her sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. When he found the woman taken in the very act of adultery in John chapter 7, he said, he that's without sin cast the first stone. And then he turned to the woman and he says, where are your accusers? She says, there aren't any, Lord. By her saying that, you know, she was, she saw his love and compassion and she submitted her life and called him Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He called it sin, what she did. It was wrong. He didn't approve of what she did, but he was merciful to her unrighteousness and her sins and iniquities he is remembering no more. Religion is holding people's sins against them, holding it over their head and using it to manipulate and tell them God won't bless you if you don't do this and this and this. That is not the new covenant. The new covenant, boy, you ought to write this on a card or something and stick it on your dashboard or on a mirror or someplace where you could remind yourself that I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The old covenant held your sins against you. The new covenant, he's merciful and he doesn't remember your sins. You know, God has completely forgiven us, but the problem is most of us haven't forgiven us. Most of you still deal with yourself. We even say it things like, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You aren't an old sinner saved by grace. If you got saved, you were an old sinner, but you got saved by grace, and now you are the righteousness of God. And God sees you righteous and holy. Even though you still got problems in your life, God sees you in the Spirit, and in the Spirit, you're a brand new person. And if you could ever see yourself in Christ instead of seeing yourself through the law, which focuses on all of your mistakes then you would be so thrilled with who you've become in Christ that you would wind up reproducing that in your actions. You would live wholly as a byproduct, as a fruit of your salvation. But most of us see ourselves as sinners. We go around with this sin consciousness and because of it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We see ourselves as inadequate and filthy and defiled and we wind up living that way because that's the way we see ourselves. Amen. Amen. Look in the next verse, verse 13. In that he saith a new covenant, this is referring all the way back to verse 8 where he started quoting from Jeremiah 31. So in verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Watch strong language. Man, this infuriated the Jews who it was all about the Ten Commandments and about the law and observing this rule and that rule. And if you didn't do it, man, they would stone you to death and they'd kill you. And here the writer of Hebrews is saying that there's a new covenant that's better promises. It's a better covenant. 
It was prophesied in the Old Testament, and God will be merciful to your unrighteousness. Your sins and iniquities he will remember no more. And the moment that he said it was a new covenant, he made the first covenant old. Now that old covenant is ready to vanish away. Man, that's strong. Those are strong, strong statements that the average person in the body of Christ does not understand. This is offensive to them. But the new covenant and the old covenant are incompatible. So in chapter 9, remember that men are the ones that put the chapter and verse divisions in here to help us reference things. Nothing wrong with that, but don't think that this is a brand new thought or a brand new teaching. It's the same thing. It's the same letter. And he goes on to say, Then verily the first covenant had ordinances of divine service, and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Again, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, I wish I had a diagram of this, but the, temp the tabernacle that Moses made, there was a tent that was placed in the center of this area. And then there was a circle of curtains that went around the whole thing. The, the entire tabernacle uh, area was a large area. But in the middle of it was this tent, and this tent was divided into two parts called the holiest, the holy, and the holiest, or the holy of holies. And the holy of holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was, and God dwelt in that part, and nobody could go into that inner part except the high priest once a year with a sacrifice to, on the Day of Atonement. But uh, into that tabernacle, only priests could enter into there. On the outside, inside of these curtains, was where they had the brazen altar. That's where they made the sacrifices of the animals and stuff like this. They sprinkled the blood. And then they went into this tent, and the first part of it, only priests could go into, and that's where they had a candlestick that burnt constantly. They had showbread. They had a, a, a um, laver and they had an incense place that symbolized prayers. And the priest could go in there and minister all of the time, but they only went into the inner part, the Holy of Holies, once a year. And that's what he's referring to right here are these two parts. And then in verse 4 it says, which had the golden censer. This is what's in that first part of this tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant Oh, that's in the holy place, um, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that uh, had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And notice this in verse 5. This is talking about in the holy of holies and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat whereof we cannot now speak particularly. What does that mean? He's talking about all of these parts of the Old Testament tabernacle and he was showing you that there was a physical thing here on the earth that represented something that was reality in heaven. But when he got to the cherubs overshadowing the mercy seat, he said, we can't talk about them now. You know why not? Cherubims are not fat little babies with a bow and arrow the way that they're sometimes depicted. You can go back to Genesis chapter 3 and when Adam and Eve sinned, he drove them out of the garden and he placed cherubs with flaming swords at the east of the garden to protect it so that nobody would ever come in there and eat of the tree of life and live forever. Cherubims are warrior angels. You can read about them in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10. It gives you a description of cherubims and they are mighty, powerful angels. And so these cherubims were over the mercy seat, not just as decoration or symbolism, but they, they literally symbolized that the way into the holy place was protected by God. And if anybody entered in through that veil into the holy place, except the high priest one time a year, he would be struck dead. And even the high priest, if he didn't cleanse himself appropriately, if he had any guile in his heart, he would be struck dead. And Josephus, a first century historian, wrote that they literally had a rope tied around the high priest's ankle that when he went in, the rope would still be outside because if he wasn't clean and God struck him dead, nobody could go get him. 
So they just would drag him out by this rope. Well, wouldn't that make you a little bit cautious to go in there with a rope tied around you in case God strikes you dead? But see, that's what these cherubims were there. They were to keep people from coming into the presence of God because they weren't worthy. They hadn't been cleansed. The Old Testament sacrifices never cleansed anybody. They were only symbolic of what was going to happen through Jesus. And so it wasn't real yet. And if a person didn't follow the symbolism to the last detail, God would strike them dead. But in the new covenant, the reason you can't talk about the cherubims is because you have been cleansed. And now you have, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, we have boldness to enter into the throne of God by the mercies of God in time of need. You do not have to fear some angel stopping you. If you were to enter into the presence of God and if an angel was to come against you and says, what makes you worthy? You could rebuke him in the name of Jesus because you have been cleansed. See, this doesn't apply anymore. The chair, and see, this is what happened when Jesus died. The veil of the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Again, this first century historian, Josephus, he wrote about the veil that was in the temple and it was such thick material and it had golden uh, thread woven through it with patterns on it that it was, it was basically indestructible and it was just one piece and the veil was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Josephus said teams of horses couldn't rip that curtain in two. And the fact that it was rent from the top, it was over 60 feet tall in Herod's temple. And for it to be rent in two, you know, this ceiling right here is probably 30 feet or something like this. That veil was twice as tall as this. And to be rent from the top to the bottom, if somebody could rend it, they wouldn't have been able to get 60 feet up in the air. This shows that it was rent by God. When Jesus died, the separation between God and man was taken away, the angels were taken off of the mercy seat, and we can now enter boldly into the very presence of God without any fear of rebuke. That's awesome. You know, if you saw this movie, The Bible, recently that was on the History Channel, Jamie and I watched that, and I wasn't real thrilled with it. She finally made me promise I'd quit saying, that's not the way it happened. <laughs> but there were some good things in it. And one of the things, I just thought about when that veil was written to and when there was an earthquake and when all of these things happened. How could those people in good conscience sew that curtain back together and go back through the motions knowing that it happened at the exact moment that Jesus died. Man, what an obvious, obvious revelation that the veil of the temple was written to. God is no longer separated. We have boldness to enter into his presence. And they just had to be hypocritical to do it. Now we can, in a sense, give some people today a pass because we weren't there, we didn't see it. Maybe it hasn't become revelation to you but I'm telling you in the New Testament, we're just as wrong as they were to go back to their religious patterns once that thing was, was done. Jesus changed it. The Lord no longer is separated from us. Your sins are not separating you from God. I know some of you are thinking, heresy. Isaiah chapter 59, the Lord says, My arm is not short that it cannot save, nor my ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins have separated you from your God. And you know what? That's absolutely true. But once Jesus came, he broke that veil. He took away the separation. He's paid for it. And under the new covenant, your sins are not separating you from God eternally or keeping him from answering your prayers. God is not moving in your life based on your holiness. This ought to just make us rejoice. But you know what? Religion has taught us so much stuff that there's some people just like afraid to let go of this because man, if I, if I let go of this sin consciousness and this revelation of how ungodly I am, what's going to keep me from living in sin? Love. 
Love will cause you to live for God more than fear ever did. And yet there's some people that have been so conditioned to serve God only out of fear that they don't know how to serve God out of love. They think that if I was to just start thinking about how much God loved me and no longer afraid of his punishment or rejection, then I wouldn't serve God. There has to be one of two problems. One of them is either you aren't born again, because if you're born again, God changes your heart and you want to live for God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. If you're truly born again, you want to live for God. You may be doing a poor job of it because you don't know the truth, but if you are born again, you want to live for God, and once you understand the love of God, it doesn't set you free to sin, but it sets you free from sin. It'll draw you out of that life, and you will start serving God out of love and mercy, not out of legalism and fear of being judged and punished. So either you just don't, you haven't been born again, or you're under the law. The law makes sin come alive. We share that out of Romans chapter 7. It makes sin have dominion over you. Romans chapter 4 verse 15 and on and on and on we could go. So in the new covenant, the cherubims have been removed because the veil is now torn away and we have boldness to enter into the very presence of God without any rebuke. I just don't have the words to communicate how important that is. And most Christians are not living that way. Most Christians are coming in before God, kind of ducking and, and God, I'm sorry, please have mercy on me. And you aren't honoring what Jesus has done. You're bearing a sin consciousness thinking that God's going to get you. You still got the rope tied around your leg in case God strikes you dead. You need to get rid of that rope and get rid of this mindset because God is not mad at you anymore. He's merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities he remembers no more. Man, that is awesome, awesome news. So let me go on and read a few more of these verses. In verse 6 it says, Now when these things were ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, that's talking about the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signified. The reason that this was significant, the reason that the priest could only go into the Holy of Holies once a year, it tells you right here, the Holy Ghost was this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. It was to show you that God had been uh, offended. We were separated from him. This veil symbolized this separation because of our sin. But in Christ, the veil has been rent in two and the separation is over and we need to get over this sin consciousness and this fear of rejection from God. We aren't allowing God to love us and to bless us because we still believe that there is a separation, that God is angry at us because of our sin. But the truth is our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. In verse 9, it says this first tabernacle was a figure for the time then present, not the time now present, but the time then present in the Old Testament before Jesus came. It was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers' washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation. If you understand this, every sentence, every verse is using some kind of a symbolism or a word that is talking about the time then present. Right there it implies that that was for then, not for now. And it was imposed upon them and for a temporary time. And all of these wordings in here are to show you that it was only temporary. It was just for the time, uh, until the time of reformation. That's the time that we live in. Reformation means everything has been changed. 
We should be serving God differently today than they served God under the old covenant because we have so much of a better covenant. And so in verse um, 11, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. In other words, it's talking about the temple that's in heaven, not something that was made with the hands of man. In verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And this is one of the huge, huge differences between the old covenant law and the new covenant grace. In the old covenant, every time a person sinned, they had to offer a sacrifice to atone for that sin. You couldn't go by last year's atonement. If you sinned, you had to offer a new sacrifice to cover your sin. Every time there was a new moon, you had to offer a sacrifice. Every time you had a child, you had to offer a sacrifice. And then once a year, the high priest went in and had a day of atonement to cover all of the sins that people weren't even aware of and that they had failed to deal with. There was just constant flowing of blood. When Solomon dedicated the temple, I forget how many, but it was, I think it was 30,000 animals that he sacrificed. Tens of thousands of animals. There was just constant flowing of blood. And in the old covenant, every time a person sinned, you had to go back and get that sin under the blood and get it forgiven. You know why? Because the sacrifices in the Old Testament never forgave a thing. They were only symbolic. They were types and shadows, but they didn't do anything. They were just symbolism. And we had to keep the symbolism in front of us constantly to remind us that the wages of sin is death. And by the grace of God, instead of killing you, he allowed you to kill an animal. But every time you slit the throat of a lamb, you had to remember that should have been me that's dying. God has allowed a substitute to die in my place. But it was a constant reminder that you needed a savior. You needed somebody else to pay for your sins. And so that symbolism was reinforced over and over and over. But in the New Testament, again, verse 12, he entered in not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once, once, and obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal. Eternal means eternal. It means forever. It means that you don't have to have another sacrifice for your sin. And yet the body of Christ today, every time you sin, you have to go get that sin confessed and under the blood or God won't bless you. There's, there's two extremes of this. The ultra-Pentecostals believe that every time you sin, you lose your salvation. And if you were to die before you get that sin under the blood and confessed, you would die and go to hell, even though you might have been saved for 30, 40, 50 years and have done, you know, been seeking and walking with God. But you sin and don't have a, you have an unconfessed sin in your life and you would die and go to hell. The same thing, just with a lesser consequence, is the more traditional denominational approach where you don't lose your salvation, but God won't heal you. He won't answer your prayers. You can't have joy. He won't bless you if you have any unconfessed sin in your life. It's the exact same principle, just with a lesser consequence. This is saying he entered in once and obtained eternal redemption. That means that God forgave all of your sins, past, present, and even sins that you haven't committed yet have already been forgiven. <laughs> and you know, I know that there are many of you that were raised just like I was, and you are just in your heart going, heresy. It's all you can do to stay in here. How can God forgive a sin before you commit it? You better pray he can forgive a sin before you commit it because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago. If he can't forgive sins before you commit them, you can't be forgiven. 
I don't know how he does it, but God can forgive sins before you commit them. And the truth is that Jesus paid for all of your sins, past, present, and even the sins you haven't committed yet have already been put under the blood. They are already dealt with. You do not have to go to the Lord and get your sin under the blood. And if you were to die with an unconfessed sin, you don't go to hell. If I thought that you did, then the moment you got born again, I'd just kill you. I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever make it to heaven is for somebody just to kill you right then. Did you know some of the ways that some of you are thinking about me right now is sin? Then you better pray you don't have a car wreck on the way home because you wouldn't go to heaven. Whether you like it or not, I am your brother and I am going to heaven and I'll probably be in the mansion next door to you, amen. <laughs> this is impossible to live under this thing that you've got to have every sin confessed or you'll go to hell or God won't answer your prayers. You can't live that way and that's the exact reason that most Christians today are totally powerless because they know that God exists, they know that he has power, but they just don't feel like they've done everything right. Their own conscience condemns them. And the truth is you haven't done everything right, but you've misunderstood that God is merciful to your unrighteousness. Your sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. And he entered in once into the tabernacle and has paid for your sins, past, present, and future your sins are not going to be a new affront against Jesus. Just look at it from a logistical standpoint. There are millions, maybe billions of Christians on the planet and they're all confessing multiple sins every day. And oh Jesus, forgive me of this. Oh God, I overate again. Oh God, I did this again. Oh God, I lusted again. And they're asking for forgiveness multiple times. If you have millions and millions of people confessing thousands of sins individually every day and stuff, it would be impossible for Jesus to be constantly reapplying the blood to all of that. Plus the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to get to this, probably not tonight, but I'm going to get to this, and he is seated at the Father's right hand. He's not working. Jesus is not there constantly reapplying the blood and getting all of your sins reconfessed and under the blood. He's seated. When he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. He dealt with your sins. He paid for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus is finished making an atonement for your sins. If you need to be saved tonight, you don't need to ask him, Lord, will you forgive my sins? I ask you to forgive my sins. That's wrong. Now praise God that God is merciful and he can translate our unbelief into faith. But you don't have to ask God to forgive you. The Bible says he already has forgiven you. It's done. When a person gets saved, they don't say, will you forgive me? I ask you to come into my heart. In Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailers said, Sirs, talking to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they didn't say, well, repent and ask Jesus if he would come and forgive you of your sins and come into your heart. That's not what he said. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe what? Believe that he's the Savior, that he paid for your sins. Believe that it's done and receive. You believe and receive, but you don't ask God to do it. You believe that he's done it. True Christianity isn't trying to get God to do something. It's finding out what he has already done and just reaching out and receiving it as a free gift. It's a done deal. Jesus has already paid for our sins. He entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption, not redemption until the next time you sin. And then you got to get re-redeemed. You got to be born again, again. You got to be re-forgiven. No, he obtained eternal redemption. What part of eternal do you not understand? Eternal redemption. And then in verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer 
sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. That was the old covenant law. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Brothers and sisters, very few Christians have had their conscience purged from dead works. Most Christians live with a conscience constantly defiled and condemned about their dead works, their wrong actions. Man, I wish I could talk fast enough. There's no way I'm going to make it. But over in Hebrews chapter 2, the last phrase, it says, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, it says that you should have no more conscience of sin. You should not be sin conscious. That's even off the radar. Most Christians feel like that's not even a positive thing. Being sin conscious is very good. It keeps me humble. Scripture says you should have no more conscience of sins. You should have your conscience purged from dead works. The next verse, verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Again, there's a large segment of the body of Christ that believe you only have inheritance and as long as you behave. And if you mess up, you lose your inheritance. Either eternally, you go to hell, or in the present, you don't get your prayers answered. God won't heal you. God won't bless you. God won't move. You lose your inheritance. This says you get eternal inheritance because of what Jesus did. And there are five times in just a few verses right here where it emphasizes that Jesus entered in once and paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future. It's already done. You know, just for time's sake, I'm trying to at least get through this ninth chapter. It says in verse um, 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. If Jesus had to pay for every individual sin that you committed, Jesus would have had to have died hundreds of millions of times over. He died one time for the sins of all men for all times. When you accept Jesus, you accepted forgiveness for all of your sins, past, present, and future sins. They're wiped out. In verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. If you read this in its context, he's saying that the Old Testament law had certain things that were absolutely essentials. One of them is that you had to be a priest of the order of, of Levi. Jesus broke that by becoming a priest after the order of Melchizedek from the tribe of Judah. And since the priesthood is changed, the law has to be changed. Then he goes into an Old Testament prophecy, Jeremiah 31, and shows you how it was prophesied that there is a coming, a new covenant made upon better promises. And in this covenant, God would be merciful to your sins and iniquities he would remember them no more. Then he shows you in the tabernacle that the veil was rent in two. The cherubs are gone. We now have complete access to God. Jesus offered himself as a living sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God. And Jesus paid for every sin that you have ever or will ever commit. One time, he paid for all of your sins. Sin has been destroyed. 
sin is not the issue with God anymore. God is not upset with you over your sin. And again, I know that there's people just saying, you can't say that. You're encouraging people to sin. You're giving them a license to sin. I'm telling you, people are sinning without a license. I'm not giving anybody a license to sin. If you understood what I said properly, you would be so thankful that Jesus loved you so much that he paid for all of your sins and didn't make it conditional on you doing everything. He knew you couldn't keep the conditions. So he just forgave you. And if you understood that, you would be so thankful you would serve God more accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. And again, I want to say praise God that he gave me the opportunity to preach this gospel. Thank God that he gave me the revelation. And one of the criticisms against people who preach grace is they'll sit there and say, you're just justifying sin. Well, you know what? I just turned 64. I think I mentioned this to you last night. And I haven't said a word of profanity in all my 64 years. I hadn't used uh, liquor. I hadn't smoked a cigarette. I've lived holy, holy, holy. You cannot accuse me of using grace to justify an immoral life. I'm living holier than most of you ever thought of living. Not because I'm doing it out of fear. Grace, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 12, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present world. The grace of God is making me serve Him out of love, not out of fear of punishment and rejection. Grace doesn't make people go live in sin. When I bring my wife flowers, when I do something nice, when I tell her I love her, and things. That doesn't make her want to go do something to hurt me and go commit adultery. Man, the more you love a person, the more it makes that person want to love you back and accept that love. And yet, religion has taught us that if you tell people that God loves them and he's not angry at them, they're going to go live in sin. That's not how it works with your wife. That's not how it works with your children when you tell them how good they are and you tell them that you're proud of them and stuff like that. That makes them draw closer to you. And yet we've somehow or another thought that we have to drive people to God out of fear instead of draw them by love. I'm telling you, we got a new covenant. And it says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that it is the gospel, this preaching about the goodness of God, that is the power of God to salvation. The gospel will draw people to God. The gospel will change people's lives. The reason that our society has not had a greater impact by the church is because we aren't preaching the gospel. We're preaching law. We're preaching legalism. And it causes people to be upset and feel condemnation and guilt. That's the purpose of the law is to make you guilty. But it doesn't reveal Jesus to people. We need to be preaching the goodness and the mercy of God. You've been forgiven of all of your sins. You know, let me, I'm going to have to quit sooner or later here. Let me turn over here though to John chapter 16 and share this with you. This is Jesus speaking the night before his crucifixion. And in John chapter 16, and in verse, uh, he'd been telling them how he was going to be crucified and how he would be leaving them. And he said in John chapter 16, verse 6, Because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. They were upset, thinking that Jesus was going to leave them. They didn't understand what he was talking about. And then he said this in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. That means it's to your advantage. It's more advantageous. It's better for you that I depart and go away. For if I go not away... The Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Well, you could, I could preach on this for a long period of time, but most of us, if Jesus could somehow or another physically manifest in his body and walk into this room, most of us would rather have that than having the Holy Spirit with us the way he is. Most of us would rather see Jesus in his physical body 
than to have the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, it's actually better for you to have the Holy Spirit with you than it is to have me in my physical earth suit present with you. Man, that puts a value on the Holy Spirit that's with us tonight that very few people acknowledge. We aren't drawing on what we've got, but what we've got is better than having Jesus in his physical body present with us. The potential is greater with the Holy Spirit than it is if Jesus was here in his physical body. That is nearly too hard to believe. And then he talked about what the Holy Spirit would do in verse 8. And when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know, I've heard people deal with this in numbers of different ways. And there are multiple, you know, scriptures can be applied sometimes in multiple ways. But I've heard people say that this is talking about he will convict the world, talking about the non-saved of these things. But I believe that the world here is just talking about anybody. The, and here's what the Holy Spirit will do. It says, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then in verse 9, he says, of sin. He knew that people were going to take this and apply it in a way that religion instructed them to do. So he just went ahead and explained it so that nobody would misapply this. The sin that the Holy Spirit convicts of is not believing on Jesus. It is not the sin of adultery, lying, stealing, not paying your tithes, this, this, and this. The sin that the Holy Spirit convicts of is the sin of not believing on Jesus because all of the rest of the sins have been paid for. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says that he is the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means atoning sacrifice. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Jesus has paid for the sins of the whole world. Sin has been dealt with. Sin has been destroyed, past, present, and future. Sin is not the issue. It's a matter of are you accepting Jesus or not? That's the only sin that will send a person to hell. Your sin of lying, adultery, homosexuality, or whatever does not send a person to hell. It will open up a door to the devil, and it will allow the devil to come in and make your life miserable but Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. The only sin that isn't covered is the sin of rejecting that payment. And this is what the Holy Spirit is dealing with people about. Have you made Jesus your Lord? Have you accepted him? That's different than what the church is doing, basically. The church is saying, you're a sinner. You're going to hell. But the truth is, Jesus paid for your sins. What we should be doing is saying, yeah, you were a sinner, and you sinned, but did you know the good news that Jesus has already paid for your sins? And they say, well, man, that's great. You mean I can just go live in sin? No. Your sins have been paid for, but now you have to accept that payment. Have you made Jesus your Lord? Have you submitted your life to him? Have you committed your life? And that's what the message should be that you need to receive this good news. The veil of the temple is rent in twain and you can now approach right into the presence of God through Jesus. But there's no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Everything goes through Jesus. You have to have Jesus. Just because people, Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world Every person has to come to grips with Jesus. Have you made Jesus your personal Lord? And if you haven't, even though he paid for your sins, you will go to hell because you refuse the payment. That's a terrible thing. And when you understand this, it makes it even more tragic that people are dying and going to hell because Jesus paid for their sins. Everything that was necessary for their salvation has already been accomplished. I meet people all of the time who just can't believe that God can forgive them. And they don't understand that he already has forgiven them. It's already a done deal. It's not, Jesus, will you forgive my sins? He's already done it. Are you going to believe and just make him your Lord? 
Will you believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved in your house? Or are you going to just continue to beg and wonder, will God do it? God's already done it. God's already forgiven your sins. Many of you are living under a sin consciousness that God doesn't even know what you're talking about. It says in Psalms 103 that he'll forgive our sins and remove them as far as the east is from the west. Jeremiah 31 and also Hebrews chapter 8. You're a, he'll be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities he will remember no more. Some of you are limping through life with shame and guilt and dragging this ball and chain through life and just, you feel like you, it's your duty. You did so bad, you've got to do penance the rest of your life. And I'm saying this in love, I'm not trying to offend you, but you are, it's just like you're slapping Jesus in the face. Jesus, you didn't do enough. I've got to suffer for what I did. You know, I met a man in Dallas who came up to me after I was preaching a message like this, and he came up to me, he was a Spanish guy and grew up in Mexico, and in Mexico the Catholic Church is different than here, I'm not here to, you know, condemn anybody or extol one group over another, but I'm saying in, some of you don't have this reference point, but in uh, Mexico, it's different. It's a re different religious system. And they actually, in Mexico, on uh, Lent season, they do the same thing here in a lesser degree, but you'll find many of the liturgical churches, they will go through fasting, and they will have to deny themselves and do without certain types of food. You know what the point of that is? To do penance for your sins. And in the Catholic Church in South America, they actually crucify people. They put them on crosses and they crucify them. And some of them die. Others they'll take down right before they die. This man that came up to me rolled up his sleeves and showed me his arms that were just scarred up and pulled his pants leg up and his knees were scarred, terrible looking scars. And when he was in the Catholic Church, he crawled three miles over broken pieces of glass to do penance for his sin and is scarred to this day because of that. You know what they're doing? They are doing penance for their sins. And we think, well, you don't have to do that. I agree. Nor do you have to sit there and bear about a sin consciousness and feel unworthy and feel like God couldn't use you because of the things you've done. In a sense, you're doing the same thing that these other people are doing, feeling like you have to pay for your sins. When the truth is, Jesus has already paid for them and he doesn't even remember them. Jesus isn't even aware of it. You're going and you're saying, oh God, I failed you so bad 20 years ago. I know you could never use me and he doesn't even remember it. You are punishing yourself. You are letting Satan do this. And the reason you're doing that, the law makes you focus on sin. It gives you the knowledge of sin. It focuses you and makes you guilty. And the church is the one that's preaching the majority of sin consciousness and law mentality. We are free from the law. God has redeemed us. He has forgiven all of your sins, past, present, and future. And if anybody takes what I've said here tonight and says, man, I love this. I can go live in sin. You ought to get born again. <laughs> you aren't saved. When you get saved, God changes your want to. If you're truly born again, you want to live for God. You just have condemned and you don't know how to do it. But this set, the love of God will set you free from sin, not free to sin. It'll change your life. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if we could ever understand this, I, I know that not everybody's going to be able to come back tomorrow, but I pray that you could come back tomorrow or get the CDs and DVDs. Don't ask for it tonight because they aren't made yet. <laughs> we'll have people do that every single time and says, I'm not going to be able to be here tomorrow. Could you go ahead and give me tomorrow's teaching? No, we can't because it hadn't been done yet. But you could sign up and we'll send it to you. You need to get the teaching I'm going to do tomorrow because I'm going to talk about the price that Jesus paid for your freedom and liberty from the Old Testament law. And again, most of us don't have a clear understanding of this. We're so focused on our sin that we aren't focused on the price that was paid for our sin. And the price that was paid was so great, it overwhelmed our sin. If you could imagine a tsunami overcoming a little seedling plant, 
That's the same type of thing. God's provision that he gave through Jesus paid for your sins a million times over. There is nothing that you owe. Jesus paid it all. God's not ticked off at you. He's not in a bad mood. God loves you. God is passionate. And you say, but I don't deserve it. You don't, but Jesus does. And Jesus has given you all of the acceptance and the love that he earned and that God has given him. He's directed it towards you. And the truth is, God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. Because when you made Jesus your Lord, you became a new person and God sent the spirit of Jesus into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. And when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. You're a new creature. You are looking on the outside and you're seeing all of your faults and failures. God is looking at you in the spirit and in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus. He's pleased with you. He loves you. He's not upset with you. And if you ever got this revelation and dwelt in what Jesus has done for you, it would free you from sin. And you would start living holy because you understand how much God loves you. It would break these bondages in your life, whereas focusing on all of your problems just amplifies them. Man, that's awesome. This is nearly too good to be true news. That's the gospel. And this is what will set people free. I'm telling you, God loves you tonight more than any of us know. I've been meditating on this for 45 years and I still feel like, man, God, there's just so much more. None of us have a full revelation of how much God loves us. But God loves you more than you realize in spite of who you are because of Jesus. Jesus has forgiven you. Just like that woman taken in the very act of adultery, Jesus didn't condemn her. He didn't condone what she did. He said it was sin. Don't go it, do it anymore. But he showed mercy and love towards that woman. And because of that, I'm convinced that woman started living for God. She made him Lord. If you could understand what I'm trying to get across tonight, it would cause you to live for God more than you've ever lived for God before. Amen. Amen. And yet we're afraid to do this. We're afraid to let go of our manipulation and control and we can exercise. Condemnation can make people walk straight. It'll make you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you'll still be miserable. As you say, glory to God, duh, and come to church and pay your tithes, they don't care what's going on in your heart. God's looking at your heart. And God wants your heart. And if he ever gets your heart, he'll get all of your dress and everything else straightened out. Amen? We need to let God deal with people. That's awesome. Father, I just pray that the Holy Spirit helps all of us to understand this great new covenant that you gave us. Help us to understand our deliverance and freedom from the law. Help us to understand, Father, that you love us and you paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future, that there's no cherub standing in the way between us, that you've wiped out the barrier that was between us and that we can come boldly unto the Father, unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Father, thank you, and I just pray that the Holy Spirit shows this, reveals it to our hearts here tonight, that we would receive this new covenant, that we would come out from under the death and condemnation of the old covenant. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing that to us. And we welcome this ministry here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm going to give an invitation for people to receive salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But right now, I know in my heart that God is speaking. There are many, many people right here that you have cried out for forgiveness a hundred times. You've tried to atone for what you've done by doing good to overcome the bad. You've done a lot of different things, but you've never forgiven yourself. You just live with a sense of shame. In a sense, I believe most people do that, but there are some people in here that this is paralyzing you. You just live with guilt and condemnation, and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you tonight. 
And if you would be honest, you'd say, man, I am sin conscious. I am living under this old covenant. I haven't entered into this new thing. This thought that God would be merciful to my unrighteousness and my sins and iniquities, He would remember no more. There's some of you that that's a brand new wrinkle in your brain. You've never thought that before. And tonight, you need to receive this. As I was praying, the Lord just stopped me and said, people need to receive this right now. So you know what I want to ask? If that's you, and again, everybody could do this to a degree, but I'm talking to those that this is a total revelation, and you know that tonight this was a word for you to help you get set free from this guilt that you've been carrying for a long, long time. If that's you, I just want you to stand right where you are. Humble yourself, and I'm going to pray for you, and I believe God's going to forgive you. I know that there's some of you thinking, well, why? I don't want to stand. I don't want to admit to people I've been living under this guilt and condemnation. But I'm asking you to stand publicly. I'm wanting you to do this before God. You need to humble yourself and just receive this deliverance. Anybody else? I know that there's some people thinking, I don't want to stand. I'm just going to sit here, but I'm going to receive this prayer. I'm going to specifically pray this won't work if you're seated. <laughs> you're going to have to stand to get in on this prayer. You can't bootleg this prayer. You got to stand to receive it. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Father, I thank you for these people, and I believe that tonight, Father, you are breaking this sin consciousness. Father, I ask the Holy Spirit to just do a miracle and to remove this guilt and condemnation. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is showing me that some of you are just as mean as a snake. And it's because you feel so guilty and so condemned. You won't let God love you because you feel you've blown and you can't give away what you don't have. If you right now would humble yourself and say, Father, I'm sorry that I haven't appreciated what Jesus has done. I thought my sin was bigger than what Jesus has done tonight. I receive the new covenant. And you, if you will open up your heart and let the love of God flow towards you, you are going to be so full of love that instead of being angry and mean as a snake, you are going to be totally changed around to where the love of God flows out of you. But you can't give something you haven't received. There's some of you standing right now that it's just been hard for you to love other people. You cannot keep a relationship and it's because you can't receive from God yourself. Open up your heart and let God love you and once you receive this love, then you will be able to turn around and love others. Father, I speak these things over these people and I thank you for taking away this anger and bitterness and rage on the inside of people. Father, I thank you for taking away their shame and their guilt. We break the depression, the multiple personalities, all of these kind of things that this stuff has led to. We break these things now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that this guilt is no longer holding people in bondage. Thank you that we are delivered from this. Thank you that you've paid for all of our sin, all of our unrighteousness. Thank you that we are now cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus of all sin, past, present, and future. And Father, I believe that guilt and condemnation is broken over people tonight and that they aren't going to live there anymore, that they're moving, they're getting out of that shame. We receive this, and Holy Spirit, I just trust that you are doing a miracle. These people have humbled themselves, and you said if we humble ourselves, that you will lift us up. I believe you are lifting us up above this shame and guilt and condemnation, and that we are walking in victory. And I thank you for doing that tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.
You can be seated. You know, tonight, if you don't know Jesus, I've preached the gospel to you. Jesus has already paid for your sins. It's not a matter of will he forgive you. He's already forgiven you. Now, will you accept it? It doesn't work. It doesn't change you. It doesn't change your destination as far as heaven or hell until you accept what Jesus has done. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He's already paid it all. It's not a matter of will he do it. It's will you accept it by making him Lord. When you make him Lord, that doesn't mean that you're promising you'll never do anything wrong because you can't keep that. You will fail. But you are willing to make him Lord. You want him to be in control. He'll be merciful to your unrighteousness. Your sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. But you have to be willing to bow the knee and turn your life over to him. If you've never done that, you need to do that. That's what salvation is. And if you've already been born again, then you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said this last night, but I'm going to say it again, that without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the things I'm talking about. This is not the way that people think. This is not how people get along with people. Everything in this world is based on performance. But with God, it's all based on receiving what Jesus did. It's based on His performance and not your performance. You cannot understand this and retain it without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John 14, 26, but when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, He will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have spoken unto you. The Holy Spirit has to reveal these things to you. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues. That's not all that there is to it, but that's part of it. And I tell you, if you don't speak in tongues, you need it. And some of you thought, well, man, I didn't know you were one of those. I don't spit and scream and I'm not your typical Pentecostal with a handkerchief wiping my sweaty brow and stuff. And so some of you didn't know what you were getting into by coming here. You just see me sitting down and talking like a normal person and you didn't know what you were getting into. But I'm telling you, I am baptized in the Holy Ghost. I pray in tongues. I've prayed in tongues today. I've prayed in tongues in this room tonight. I'm a tongue talker. And I'm telling you that I wouldn't have had the power of God. I wouldn't have understood these things if the Holy Spirit wasn't in my life. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need it. It's not optional. You can go to heaven without it, but why would you want to? If you're going to have victory in this life, you need the baptism.